to Swan Creek Baptist Church. We want to thank you for joining us with our online ministry today. Again, so thankful for the technology that makes all of this possible. Uh, so thankful for Brother Micah and, and all his effort uh, to get these things uploaded uh, so that we can continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you would be encouraged in the Lord today, that you would be challenged from his word. My prayer is that we would all hear from God today.
morning? Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> How cool. I know you had some idea what we were doing. Well, good morning. Uh, this is what I, I came into this morning, and uh, what an encouragement uh, just to see your faces. Uh, and I just, I love it. I love um, thinking through the truth that God has every member of Swan Creek Baptist Church in this church on purpose. And we love each other, and God has put that love in our hearts for one another. And I miss you, church family. And this is not God's will that we are separated like this. God wants us to gather, and we will gather again in His name. Uh, it's not natural, it's not normal for, for you not to be here using your spiritual gifts, but we will gather again, and, and you will be using your spiritual gifts again, and, and I look forward to that day, and I want to encourage you to look forward to that day. Hey, there's no telling how God's going to use this. Uh, friends of yours that maybe have been tuning in through Facebook or YouTube, uh, maybe they'll come and be a part of this faith family after this pandemic is over. So church family, be encouraged. I certainly am. Uh, the Lord is at work, and I praise his name. We love you, and we can't wait to be together again in church. As you can see, church family, uh, Pastor Scott was very encouraged. Uh, I believe his heart was blessed through being able to see your faces. Uh, I get to do that this morning myself. And this was a challenge for us, um, for the Children's Church kids, um, to do something this next week to be a blessing for a friend. And so that's what we were doing. Uh, Seth, Miss Jean, and myself came to be a blessing to our friend, our pastor. And this is a challenge I'd love to pass to you guys is, this week, would you be willing to maybe record yourself or, or take a couple pictures of you doing something for a friend? It could be writing a letter or preparing a meal, whatever it might be, and share that with me. And I'd love for our children's church kids to be able to see that, to be able to watch spiritual people that they already respect in the Lord serve others. Um, so that's just a challenge I want to pass to you guys this morning. Uh, we don't have very many announcements. Um, we do want to just continue to encourage you uh, with your giving. Um, the same as it has been, um, you guys have been very faithful in trusting the Lord. Uh, I know the Lord's been very faithful to provide for my family. Um, and you can still do it the same way, um, mail in. Um, your checks to the church. Um, you can bring it right over to the entryway and put it in the box, um, or you can give online. And that's very straightforward. Uh, again, if you have any questions, you can just call the office um, or call pastor. Um, be sure they're glad to help you there. We are only $3,000 short of reaching last year's goal for Faith Promise. Um, so that means we're about $5,200, $5,300 short of meeting this year's goal, $88,000. Um, and wow, what a, what a blessing. Uh, if your family has not committed um, to giving a faith promise, uh, pray about that. Um, see what God would have you to do. Uh, let's reach that goal um, to support our missionaries. I uh, just want to encourage you with that, church family. We do have our ongoing Bible studies. Um, we're having them uh, with the Iwana children on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock with the Puggles and the Cubbies. Um, but then on Friday nights, it's just kind of open to everyone. Um, and you just go to our church website or Facebook page after you've downloaded the Zoom app and you just kind of wait for the meeting to start. So if you have any questions, just reach out. I'd be glad to help. Um, Mr. John knows how it works. Pastor knows how it works. Um, and we'd love for you to participate. It's been a very good encouragement uh, to see people's faces as we're hearing the truth, um, the way God designed it. Guys, that's what we have as far as announcements for this morning. Uh, I was reading this morning my devotions, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. It says this, as, there, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And we have been fed. Our pastor feeds us truth. He is a good shepherd. Um, and that's God's design is for us to be able to go through something like this rooted and grounded. And as we go through this, the last part of the verse says, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And so that would be my encouragement this morning as you look to the word of God, as you go through the circumstances you're going through is um, rooted and grounded in Christ, abounding in thanksgiving.
So guys, let's pray this morning. Let's pray for tender hearts, uh, the right response to the word of God. Uh, let's pray together. Father, thank you, uh, Lord, that you can look out and see the faces of our church family this morning. Lord, I thank you that you are a faithful God who doesn't change. The word of God has not changed. You have not changed. And Lord, that we can trust you. Uh, we can believe that what your word says is true. And so Lord, I just pray for uh, the church family that uh, might be discouraged or might be hurting. Um, Lord, maybe a, a member is kind of lonely. And Lord, I pray that right now that you would give them uh, deep roots in who you are in Christ, that you would be a companion, a friend like no one else can be. Lord, I pray for our hearts this morning, that we would be humble and submissive, uh, ready to hear from the word of God. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world made, was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believeth on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him, and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake, and he cometh after me, if preferred before me. For he was before me, and of his fullness have all we received in grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only God Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. in front of us, helping us to think on things that are true and right. And it is true. Our God is great. And church family, we just want to continue to meditate on the greatness of our God. We want to continue to sing his praises. If you're watching today and, and, and you really honestly 
do not sing to the Lord. You really honestly don't know him as the great God and Savior that these ladies just sang about. Please see yourself in need of a forgiver. See from the scriptures that you have broken God's law and that your rebellion against God it has earned you separation from God in a place called hell. But God does not want that. God desires a relationship with you. Jesus Christ came to this earth. He took on a human body and he hung on a tree in your place. Christ died on the cross for you, paying for every one of your wrongs so that you might have an opportunity to receive his gift of forgiveness. Friend, please don't just know about Christ. Don't just know about his gift of forgiveness. Receive it for yourself. And then you as well will sing of how great God is. All right, let's go together, please. John chapter 20 and Colossians chapter 1. Find those spots. John chapter 20 and Colossians chapter 1. I know you're at home, but I want to encourage you to grab a copy of Scripture and see it for yourself right there in God's Word. So let's go together. John chapter 20 and Colossians chapter 1. You know, society will accept any number of answers to the question, who is Jesus Christ? As long as you don't give the right answer. As long as you don't give the biblical answer, society will accept your answer. For example, you could say with A.N. Wilson, the British novelist, Jesus was a, a good Jewish lad with good moral teachings. And nobody would buck and kick against that answer. Or you could say with Bishop John Shelby Spong, Jesus was a married rabbi and his miracles were falsified and again you get the nod of approval if you were to give an answer like that but if you were to give the answer that jesus is god if you were to confess like the eyewitnesses that we see recorded in scripture that jesus is god you will be ostracized you will be maligned you will be persecuted just as the apostles were. But you could say like Professor Morton Smith that Jesus was an influential magician. And again, nobody would bat an eye. Or you could say like John Allegro that Jesus wasn't a historical figure at all. Again, no problems. But if you are to profess Christ as God, unacceptable in our society today. Why? Well, if you admit that Jesus Christ is God, then you must admit that his word is true. And since he is God and since his word is true, then you and I must submit to the word of God. And for so many folks, that's unacceptable. I will not have this man reign over us, is the attitude of so many folks today. But if Jesus Christ is God, then his word is true, and we must submit to the word of God. Go with me to John chapter 20, verse 31, please. John chapter 20, verse 31. But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So again, the Apostle John is writing here, and, and you know as well as I do, the Apostle John walked with Jesus Christ for three years. He was an eyewitness of the miracles. He saw the crucifixion. He saw God die on that cross. He saw God raised from the grave. And here, in the last part of this gospel, 
Again, look again, verse 31. But these things are written that you might believe. Believe what? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. So again, the reason Satan wants cloudiness in our society today about who Jesus Christ is because when we see Christ for who he is, we will know him as Savior, we will know him as Lord. We will find life in his name, the scripture says. You know, at the time that the Gospel of John was written, all the other apostles had been martyred. They had been martyred for their proclamation of Christ. Again, tradition holds it that Paul was sawn asunder by Nero. James. James was put to death by the sword. Peter. Peter was crucified upside down. Why? For the proclamation of Christ. See, the enemy doesn't want Christ to be preached. He doesn't want there to be clarity on who Jesus Christ really is. You say, why, Pastor? Well, the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, whose minds the God, that's Satan, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God, should shine on them. See, the enemy knows if you learn the truth about Christ, if you learn the truth about who he is, and you learn the truth about his death, his burial, and the resurrection, that you too will be born again, that you too will be rescued from hell. And Satan doesn't want it. So Satan continues to insert lies about who Jesus truly is. I love the Gospel of John. Look with me at John chapter 1 as the Apostle introduces us to the real Jesus. Look at John chapter 1 and go down to verse 1, please. John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So again, the introduction to the to book of John, unashamedly, John says, Jesus is God. See it again, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus Christ. And the Word, Jesus Christ, was with God. And the Word, Jesus Christ, was God. See, John could have said a lot of things in his epistle. God, John could have said a lot in this gospel. But he doesn't. He wants us to know who Christ really is. He wants to make the main thing the main thing. And he says, Jesus is God. Look at verse 2, John chapter 1, verse 2, and it says the same was in the beginning with God. Again, he's still introducing Jesus Christ, and he explains that Jesus Christ was there. There in the beginning, Jesus was there. Why? Because Jesus is the eternal God. Listen, there has been attacks on the eternality of Christ that date all the way back to the early church. For example, in the book of Colossians that we're studying together, they were, the false teachers were teaching that Jesus was some kind of demigod rather than the eternal God. We saw last week that the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus was a created angel, the archangel Michael, before he came to earth, rather than the eternal God. The Mormons, the Mormons teach that Jesus is the brother of Satan, Listen to this quote from the Book of Mormons. Mormons. He is also, talking about Christ, he is also the only begotten physical offspring of God by procreation on earth. 
Jesus is the only person on earth to be born of a mortal mother and an immortal father. That is why he is called the only begotten son. Again, this is from the Book of Mormons. Lies about Christ. Lies about Christ being God, the eternal God. Look back in our text. Verse 2 again, the same, talking about Jesus, was in the beginning with God. John's not leaving any wiggle room there. Christ didn't start, his life didn't start in some dank cave on the outskirts of Bethlehem. No, Jesus is the great I am. Jesus is the eternal God. From everlasting to everlasting, Jesus Christ is God. Let's continue on. John chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made by him, Jesus Christ. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Again, John is just going through and just nailing down who Christ really is. He starts out with saying, Christ is God. Christ is the eternal God, and he comes to verse 13 and he's verse 3 and he says, Christ is the creator. Wow. What a powerful introduction to the powerful gospel of John. But what a powerful introduction to a remarkable God. His name is Jesus. Sounds a lot like our study in the, the book of Colossians. Last week we learned together that Jesus Christ is the revealer. We also learned from the book of Colossians that Jesus Christ is the creator. Not only the creator, Jesus Christ is the sustainer. And again, friends, I praise God for these biblical truths. I praise God that he has revealed himself through his word. Because you and I, we can find rest in Christ. We can find rest in the person of Jesus Christ. For example, you think about Christ being the sustainer. This world that seems so out of control, but to know the biblical fact that Christ is the one that is holding all this together, boy, I can rest in that. Christ is the sustainer of all things. You know, I look in my daughter's middle school science book. And as you study through this secular science book that scientists have devised the anthropomorphic principle, which states the universe appears to be carefully designed for the well-being of mankind. Yeah, and his name is Jesus. Christ is the creator and he designed all this, he created all this for the well-being of mankind. Scientists call it the anthropomorphic principle. You know, scientists also say that if the earth changed its speed of rotation, that every one of us, everything would, would fly off. Scientists say that if the, if the earth was to be any closer to the sun, we would all burn up. If the earth was to be any farther away from the sun, we would all freeze to death. But again, the earth is, is not going to wobble off of its axis. The, the earth is not going to move any closer to the sun or any farther from the sun. Why? Because my God, Jesus Christ, is the sustainer of all things. Christians, we can rest in these truths. So again, we're learning together that Christ is supreme in creation. He is Lord over his material creation. But not only is he Lord over the material creation, he is also Lord over his spiritual creation. Let me show you to you in the scriptures. Go back to Colossians chapter 1, please. Colossians chapter 1, and go down to verse 18. And he... Jesus Christ. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So not only is Christ 
supreme in creation. Christ is supreme in his church. The scripture says that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Now again, this is not like head of a company or, or head of a corporation. Now think about it as, as our physical head. My head and your head, they control the actions of our body. Well, again, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He controls every one of his believers. So Christ is supreme, supreme in his universal church. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22 again describes this headship or, or lordship of Christ over his church. He, God the Father, put all things under his, Jesus Christ, feet and gave him, Jesus, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Christ, he is at the chief position, the, the highest rank, the ultimate authority. He is the head of his church. All believers, from the day of Pentecost, the birth of the church, to the day when Christ comes back and raptures his church, all of those believers are underneath this one head, Christ. He is the sovereign of the church. He controls every part. He gives life to every member. He gives direction. He is the head of his church. And you and I, we have got to choose as believers to bow to his preeminence. Give him that supreme place. Submit to his will and, and not our own will. Go back to the text again. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. And he, Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he, Jesus Christ, might have the preeminence. So again, the scriptures are so clear that Jesus is the head. Jesus is to, to have first place, not the pastor. Jesus is to be the, the, the supreme authority in the church, not the deacon. Jesus Christ is to have first place, not the choir, not the, the youth group, not the wealthy church member. Christ and only Christ is to have that supreme position that first place in his church. So church family, let me ask you, is that true of Swan Creek Baptist Church? Is Christ first in our worship? I mean, is Jesus Christ front and center? Is he why we gather? Is he why we sing? Is Christ's first place in our worship? Is it Jesus? Is that why we bring our first and our best on a Sunday? Our offering, our faith to promise is Christ. Is Christ why we do what we do? And my prayer is that every heart would say yes. It is for Christ. Christ wants to be first in our worship. Christ wants to be first in our witness. Listen, the reason we reach out to this community the way we do, the reason we, we spend thousands and thousands of dollars to reach into this community is because of Christ. He is to have that lordship, that headship. He is to give the direction, and he already has given the direction. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So Christ must be first in our worship. He must be first in our witness. He must be first in our work. Everything we do, do for the glory of God. Do it with your whole heart, the scripture says, as unto the Lord. Why? Because Christ is supreme in the church. 
there was a woman and she was wanting to join a very fashionable church in her town. But this woman was from the, the wrong side of the tracks, if you know what I mean. So she approached the pastor about joining the church and, and he suggested to, for her to go home and to think about it carefully for a week and come back and, and tell him what she thought and whether or not she should join the church. So the young woman took the counsel from the pastor. She went home for a week and thought about joining the church and came back still desiring to be a member of the church. And the pastor said, go home and read your Bible one hour every day for one week and come back and tell me if you still think you should join. So again, the young lady, very submissive, went home and, and read her Bible one hour a day for a week. And she came back assuring the pastor that she still wanted to join the church. The pastor said, well, I've got one more suggestion for you. I want you to go home and every day pray and ask the Lord if he wants you to join our church. Well, the woman didn't come back. The pastor didn't see her for six months. One day downtown, he, he bumped into her and he asked her, well, did, did you do what I asked you to do? What did you decide? And she said, Pastor, I did just what you said. I went home and, and I prayed uh, just like you suggested. And the Lord said to me, don't worry about not getting into that church. I've been trying to get in there myself for the last 20 years. Oh, church family, may it never be. May we never do church without Christ. Listen, church without Christ is nothing more than a social club. Christ must have that preeminent place always. In my heart and in your heart, in the heart of this church, we must put Christ first. Listen, Christ is represented to this community through this local church. This community cannot see the, the physical Jesus, but Jesus Christ has chosen His church to represent Him in this community. Church, we've got to do it well. And the only way we're going to do it well is if we keep Christ at that preeminent, supreme place that He deserves. First place. So number one this morning, we are learning that Christ is supreme, not only in His creation, but He's also supreme in His church. But now the scripture is going to teach us that Christ is also supreme in resurrection. Go back to the scriptures, please. Colossians chapter 1 and look at verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now again, the scripture says that, that Christ is the firstborn from the dead. Now again, this is not firstborn chronologically. Uh, Christ was not the, the first ever raised from the dead. You think about the Old Testament. Uh, Elijah was used by God to, to raise the, the widow woman's uh, Zarephath, to raise her son from the dead. You go to the New Testament and Jesus Christ raised from the dead a young lady, the, the ruler of the synagogue's daughter. Lazarus was also raised from the dead. So again, Christ was not raised from the dead first in chronological order, but Christ was the first to raise from the dead and never to die again. Again, this truth has amazing implications in my life and in yours. Hold your hand in Colossians and go to John chapter 14, please. John chapter 14. Again, thinking through the truth that Christ is supreme in the resurrection. Look at John 14, 
verse 19, please. Jesus says, and in yet a little while, the world seeth me no more, but you see me because I live, you shall live also. So again, the truth is that because of Christ's resurrection, because Christ is supreme in resurrection, that, that we too as believers have victory over death. Death, where is your sting? No, it's no longer. There's no longer the sting of death. Why? Because Christ took the sting of death. And because he has been raised, we too will be raised. Praise God. Christians, I want to encourage you. You should no longer fear death. God wants you to have absolute confidence in your own resurrection. Again, you will be raised on the basis of Christ's resurrection. I have observed Christians during this pandemic that are just as scared as a lost person. Now listen, I'm not beating you down with this. I understand that this pandemic is scary. It's different than anything we've ever been through. But Christians, let's just be honest. To live is Christ and to die is gain. The Bible says there is no fear in death because perfect love cast out fear. Friends, to die is gain. Christ wants you and he wants me to have confidence in our resurrection. Why? Because Christ is supreme in resurrection. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. For our citizenship, talking about Christians. For our citizenship is in heaven. From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Wait for the rapture who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he also is able even to subdue all things to himself. So the scriptures are clear. Yes, Christ is alive. Christ has been resurrected, and today he has supremacy over resurrection, and we too will rise. Listen, when you and I, when we put a loved one in Christ in the grave, when one of our loved ones that knew the Lord as Savior, when, when we bury them, hey, the individual is already with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know that truth. We glory in that truth. But that body, we, we lay in the grave. But it's not going to stay in that grave. The scriptures are clear when Christ comes back for his church, when the rapture takes place, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Look what 1 Corinthians 15 says. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption and it is raised in corruption. So when your loved one and my loved one, when, when Christ comes up in rapture, when they are raised up from the dead, the Bible says they are going to be raised incorruptible. Wow. Why? How is this possible? Christ is supreme in resurrection. And lastly this morning, I want you to see that Christ is also supreme in reconciliation. Go back to our scripture, please. Colossians chapter 1, and look at verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. Again, Christ is supreme. He's supreme in creation, he's supreme in his church, he's supreme in resurrection, and he is supreme in reconciliation. You think about two enemies, two enemies that are at odds with one another, and when, and when they do make peace, we would say that they have been 
reconciled. Blair and I, we do biblical counseling together. And a lot of our biblical counseling is with hurting couples. And we've heard too many couples say things like, this marriage is too far gone. This marriage is beyond repair. He is impossible. She is impossible. I'm tired of working at this marriage. We've heard couples make statements like this, and, and Blair and I, we don't walk away hopeless. No, we, we, we walk away full of hope. Why? Because Christ is supreme in reconciliation. Look at my life before Christ came into my life. Look at verse 21. And you, this again, before Christ, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Again, this Bible describes my life and your life before Christ. The Bible says that our lives were alienated. We were estranged. We were cut off. We were separated from God. We could not have been any more separated. Seems hopeless, doesn't it? Keep going. Go back to the Scriptures, verse 21. And you who were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. The scripture says that I was an, an enemy or God was an enemy in my mind. I was hostile towards God in my thought life. I hated God. Go to John. John chapter 3, please. Again, it's describing my life, your life, before Christ reconciled us. John chapter 3, and go down to verse 19. John 3, verse 19. And this is the condemnation, that light, Jesus Christ, is come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved or exposed. So again, before Christ, I was alienated from God. I was separated from God. I was estranged from God. And I was also an enemy of God, an enemy of God in my mind. I hated God. Why? Because I love my darkness. I hated God. I hated his law. I hated his standards. I desperately needed to be reconciled. See, sin, sin was the root of my alienation from God. God cannot fellowship with sin. The Bible says in Habakkuk that God's eyes are too holy to look upon sin. So my sin, your sin, had to be dealt with before God and man could be reconciled. Look how God dealt with it. Look at the reconciliation that God offers you if you're listening without Christ. Go to Colossians chapter 1 verse 19. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him, Jesus Christ, should all the fullness dwell. Fully God, fully man. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. So again, the scriptures are clear. Christ's death on the cross, that is the only way to be reconciled to God. I could never have done it on my own. See, I was born with the sin nature. The scripture says, in my mother's womb, I was conceived in sin. I was born with a sin nature. And since then, since I was born, I have broken God's law so many times. And I can't go back in time and fix those laws that I've already broken. I had to have a redeemer, a reconciler, 
someone to make peace between me and God. And he did it. The Bible says he did it through his cross. Friends, please hear me. Christ was my sacrifice. Christ paid the price for all the wrongs I've ever committed and ever will commit. Christ was my substitute. It was for my transgressions. That's the reason he was beaten. That's the reason he was nailed to the tree. That's why he bled and died. It was for the wrongs that I had done. See, Christ, he made a way for me to have peace with God. And he did it through the cross of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Romans chapter 5 describes it again. It says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son. Friend, that's the only way. It's the only way for the, the hostility, the separation, it's the only way for there to be peace between you and God was through Christ, his sacrifice, and his substitutionary death. Look at the goal of his resurrection. I'm sorry, the goal of his reconciliation. Look at verse 21, Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. So again, the reason Christ died on that cross was to reconcile me and God the Father. Christ, reconciliation, makes me, the scripture says, holy. Because of Christ's death on the cross, I was set apart for sin. Now I'm set apart from sin. And I'm set apart to God. All because of the reconciliation that Jesus offered me. Look again, the scripture says that you, verse 22, it says, and in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, not only holy, but un blameable, blameless. Christ reconciliation makes a believer blameless in the eyes of God the Father without blemish. And again, this is so hard for us to wrap our minds around, but the truth is that Christ on the cross in my place made a way for me to be reconciled to God. So now when God the Father looks upon me, he sees me clothed in the righteousness of Christ. God sees me now like I one day will be in heaven. He already sees me as holy. He already sees me as blameless. All because of Christ. Look again in verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. The idea of being unreprovable is no one can bring a charge against us. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, he might cast charges against you and against me, but Christ again declares it is finished. Once and for all, paid in full, unreprovable, all because Christ is supreme and reconciliation. Earlier, we looked at the truth. If you admit that Jesus Christ is God, you must admit that his word is true. And since he is God and his word is true, then you must submit to it. Friend, is there anything taught in God's word that you refuse to submit to, you refuse to obey? If that is the case, repent now. Submit now to the Supreme One. It's His Word. Let Christ have that preeminent place. 
That's where the joy of the Lord is. Let Christ have preeminence in your, in your marriage, in your family. Let Christ be Lord over His church, over your workplace. Let Christ have preeminence. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the Bible. And I thank you for the way you do introduce us to who you really are. Lord, I believe with all my heart there are lies trying to be inserted about you coming from all different directions. But God, I thank you that we know the truth. You've given it to us in writing. Thank you for the revealed truth about Jesus Christ. We thank you that, that the Lord Jesus is the creator of all things. That he made each and every one of us on purpose. And he has a specific purpose and plan for us in our lives. Thank you that Christ is the sustainer. That he is the one that holds all of this together. Oh Lord, may your Christians rest in that fact. Lord, we thank you that the Lord Jesus is supreme, not only in creation, but in the new creation, his church. Thank you that Christ is the head of every believer from Pentecost to the day of rapture. Thank you, Lord, that Christ is our head, that he is directing us and guiding us and nurturing and nourishing. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Lord, my prayer is that you would have first place in this church. Father, I thank you so much for the truth that Christ is supreme in everything. And my prayer is that he would be supreme in everything in my life. That I would willingly bow my knee and to submit to the Lordship of Christ. Lord, tenderize my heart, please. Show me areas where I'm pushing you out and trying to have my way above your way. Show me areas in your scriptures, Lord, while I'm not submitting to your word. Lord, please help my brothers and sisters as they respond to you and to you only today. Father, certainly I pray for someone that is listening today that is without Christ. Oh Lord, may they know Christ for who he really is. Not just as creator, not just as sustainer, but may they know him today as savior. May they put their personal trust that what Christ did on the cross was for them. Please, Lord, save them today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church family, I want to encourage you to continue to study out who Jesus Christ is. But again, don't allow this knowledge just to stay right here. Allow this knowledge of Christ to change your entire world. Let Christ be Lord. A couple of assignments for you. I want to encourage you to get back into Colossians chapter 1 and go to verse 23 and study out the evidence of reconciliation. The evidence that someone really has trusted Christ as their Savior. Look at those evidences that are given in Colossians 1 verse 23 and, and work through those truths this week and we'll break them down together next Sunday morning. I also want to challenge you with another assignment. I want to challenge you this week to write out your salvation testimony. Write out that day, that time, that you accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Again, take time and, and talk to God and, and really work through this. Because one of the most powerful witnessing tools that you have, that I have, is your personal salvation testimony, your story. But it might be that someone sits down to do this assignment sits down to write out their salvation testimony when they came to Christ and they realize that they don't have a salvation testimony. 
that they realize that there has never been a point in time where they have repented and put their personal trust in the finished work of Christ. Friend, if that's the case, stop right then. Stop writing and turn to Christ and accept Him as Savior. But again, two assignments. Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, looking at those evidences of someone who truly has been reconciled and also write out your salvation testimony. Church family, we love you in the Lord. We're praying for you. We're available to help, to encourage. Please call us and let us know how we can do that. Lord bless you.